In the last video, which I highly recommend you look at before you watch this video, we looked at how the proto Yorubas migrated from the Niger Bernier Valley, with some goose settling down and founding Ile Ife, where they eventually developed into a complex house society. We kick off things today with the creation story of the Yorubas, which also happens to be Ife's creation mythology. It is believed that an all powerful and indifferent being, called Oludumari, sent two celestial entities to a watery head to create land and life. They were given a chicken with six legs, a snail shell filled with sand, a palm nut, and a chameleon. These entities made their way to head using a chain that descended from the heavens, where they made contact with the head is believed to be Ileife. This is a summarized version of the Yoruba creation story. What's important is the name of one of the celestial beings, Obatala. I would like to take this opportunity to say a very big thank you to my new patrons. Your support is something I'm very thankful and grateful for. If you are feeling generous and would love to join these wonderful people, please stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Now let's get on with the video. The formation of mega houses led to increased stability and security in Ile Ife. This allowed for the improvement of tools and specialization of labor into professions. Claypot pottery had been one of the oldest professions in Ile Ife, in which a majority of its practitioners were women. Their husbands usually were blacksmiths, who helped their wives burn the wet clay pots, since it was this process that led Piakeg people to discover high on bloom in the Niger Benue Valley. Farming and hunting became gilded trades during this period as well. Hunters were held in high esteem. Not only did they provide meat for the community, but also searched for clay deposits in the forest to harvest, brooks and streams to fetch drinking water from, and functioned as night security. Farmers also enjoyed a high level of prestige in society, as they were responsible for food security. Most farmers practiced meat scrubbing, which ensured a steady food supply all year round. Men also specialized in palm wine tapping and oil palm processing. Air plating, midwifery, circumstition, weaving raffia products, matting, spinning cotton, and weaving cotton textiles were all professions that women also engaged in. Around this period, the people of Ife decorated the places of warships with sculptures made of clay or soapstone. They also adorned their shrines by laying poor shed pavements using terracotta tiles or cobblestone. The specialization of some settlements, in a particular skill or production, came about as the result of the professionalization of labor, and their names were often derived from these advantages or skill sets. For example, Okearu, specialized in the production of herbal remedies, hence its name. Each mega house had a market, which promoted and stimulated trade between the mega houses. As the population and prosperity of Ife grew, so did the quality of the products produced, and by the 9th century, Ife had developed into a major trading hub, connecting trade between the forest states and the savannah which lied to the north of the forest. So markets grew larger and offered a wider variety of goods. Over time, they started to draw trade from other communities within Ife's region of the forest. Kulanot and palm oil were grown in large quantities in Ife and exported to the savannah region. Other communities in this region, like Ijebu, exported salt and dry fish through Ife and imported exotic herbs from the savannah. Curry shells used for money and rituals were imported into Ife from the Indian Ocean through the Middle East. As regional trade grew, so did the economy of Ife, making it a very attractive area to settle. However, the old settlements were very resistant to change as each protected their lands from occupation. In the past, immigrants usually came individually or as a family seeking inclusion into a settlement, but this wave was different. These immigrants were not willing or ready to be absorbed by the old settlements as they were looking to establish their own settlements. As you can imagine, the old settlements refused and rather designated a stranger area in which access to farmland was restricted by the rigid claims to boundaries by the old settlements. The traditional socio-political arrangements had to evolve to meet the new threats if they faced. Up until now, mega-houses ruled their settlements autonomously, without interference from the other mega-houses. 
But the new wave of immigrants, which was not getting absorbed fast enough, was becoming a problem that could no longer be swept away. So a solution had to be found. The mega houses, unwilling to lose their autonomy, aligned themselves into a confederacy of kings. When no king was powerful than the next, none was membership permanent or compulsory. The Ife confederacy was preceded over by a king from the member settlements. This position was ceremonious and wielded no real power over the mega houses. After the death of the king of the confederacy, the next king was chosen from another settlement, preventing any ambitious house from becoming too powerful. This was as far as the mega houses were willing to change. The climate of Ife changed again, bringing in a warmer and drier climate to Ife. Unpredictable Hana droughts were in the space with little or no rainfall. This began to dry up the swampy valley of Ife, opening up those lands for the taking. Some groups from the stranger area took this opportunity, and as expected, conflicts between the settlers and the old mega houses broke out. The new settlers were able to build a perimeter wall to lay claim to the land, and it worked. But there was just one problem. It was built figuratively and literally in the middle of a fair. Not only did this throw off the balance of power between the old 30 mega houses, but displaced the blue people out of their ancestral lands. The Deta Mega House, aligned with the Hugo, rallied other mega houses to attack the wall builders. Hostilities raged within Ife for some few decades, which coupled with the change in climates and repeated farming, saw large waves of migration out of Ife. As the conflict protracted, some mega houses were decimated and abandoned. The conflict raged on in Ife unresolved, until a pox outbreak severely decimated the Deta Alliance. Due to their diminished strength, they agreed to a truce and ultimately established an alliance with the war builders, which left the Ubo feeling betrayed by this newfound peace. I feel it's time to let you on a little secret, and you will have to recall the creation story I told you earlier. While Obatala was on his way to create the world, he rested and got drunk on palm wine, leaving the job of creation to the other celestial being. Obatala was also the name of the king of the Deta Mega House towards the end of the conflict. The world builders called the settlement Iremo, and their leader towards the end of the conflict was Odudua. The name Obatala and Odudua are significant figures in Yoruba mythology. One is believed to be the father of the Yorubas, while the other created the head. These names are ascribed to multiple people of myths and legends over the centuries. However, Obatala got reckoned into the Yoruba creation story to be history. It was the king of the Deta Mega House and Ife Confederacy by the end of the conflict. It's a competence and failure to lead the Ife Confederacy to victory was represented as drunkenness in some fashion of the creation myth. The other celestial being that picked up the mantle of creation and completed the job is usually Orumila or Dudua. One thing that is consistent in any version of the creation story is Sobatala's incompetence. Now let's get back to the story. Ileife was left in ruins after decades of fighting. The old mega houses had become a shadow of what they were. Famine and drought ravaged the land, and the next generation was left to rebuild from the ashes. The truce between the Odudua and the Obatala groups led to the reorganization of political life in Ife. This allowed for a new permanent existence which recognized both the wall settlers and the old mega houses as equals, including the Ubu, who could not accept the arrangement. They migrated to the housekets of Ife, to an area called Igbo Ubu, from where they raided Ife in quick lightning attacks. These attacks often led to the adduction and burning of houses, which resulted in a lot of casualties in Ife. The people of Ife, under the leadership of Odudua, built a wall around the city with the old mega houses being resettled and rebuilt, but this time around the Remo with a new political framework where kingship was a divine institution. A city-state model of organization was adopted, with the palace of the Oni situated in the very center of the city. This newfound peace and stability allowed the population to grow with rapid urbanization, becoming one of the biggest cities in the rainforest belt of West Africa by the 12th century. The new system of government recognized Odudua as the only king of Ife, and only from his lineage could kings emerge. Odudua dissolved the authority of the Obas of the old settlements, together with the confederacy of Ife, 
he had the power to appoint any citizen of Ife to any office within his government. The city was divided up into quarters, with each quarter overseen by a quarter chief. Some of the hobbers from the old mega houses were made quarter chiefs. Prominent citizens were also appointed as quarter chiefs, and like the kingship, chieftaincy was hereditary. The Oni also appointed special duty chiefs, like a war chief, palace chiefs, and a market chief. However, these positions were not hereditary. Under this political structure, the possibility for corruption and abuse of office was left unchecked. This led to the creation of the Uguni, a secret society group that held any holder of public post of authority to account, including the Oni. During the reign of Odudua, he set out to achieve two things. The first was to rebuild the economy of Ife, and the second was to establish an economic support system for the monarchy. A general market was built around the vicinity of the palace, with the Oni as the patron of trade. This enabled the market to enjoy protection and security from the Oni, and as such, allowed Ife to once again thrive in interregional trade. Horses were imported from the Inupi countryside, which were highly prized among the chiefs and the Oni. Royals from other city states in this region, who wanted horses, could only buy them from Ife. Under Odudua, Ife saw an upsurge in industrial manufacturing. Two items were the center of focus iron and diamorphic glass beads. Iron smelting and glass smelting were twin pursuits in Ife. Glass was discovered mostly the same way iron was discovered. Advances in iron smelting allowed for furnaces to reach high temperatures. These high temperatures, together with potassium rich wood hash and sand present in the furnace, yielded the first earliest quantities of glass. These furnaces were able to reach these temperatures because they were situated on the hill slopes, placing them in the path of the wind. If I produce this highest grade of iron, which was high in titanium, by using lemic black sand and geonite rich ore, if a iron was highly sought after, making if a major supplier of machets, spear blades, arrow blades, and swords to the different emerging Yoruba city states. The bead industry also expanded greatly during this period. Odudua turned to glass beads to adorn his warrior regalia, from his crown to his clothes, to his bracelets, wristlets, and anklets. The glass industry grew to become Ife's most important economic bedrock, paving a path of creation for its empire. After the first wall, which had a circumference of 7 km was finished, a second wall, with a circumference of about 15 km, was commissioned to be built in order to protect the new settlements that had begun to emerge outside the first wall. After the reign of Odudua, the Ubu marauders were still a plague to Ife. Legend has it that a beautiful woman named Moremi offered herself as a peace offering to the king of the Ubu. She learned the secret of the hammer and revealed it to the Oni of Ife, who exploited this knowledge against the Ubu and defeated them. Those who refused to swear loyalty to Ife were expelled from his realm, while those who did were reintegrated into the city. The legend of Moremi is meant to illustrate how much the people of Ife loved their new city and the sacrifices they were willing to take to protect her. Over the next four centuries, Ife became a city of legends, a royal city that had become a symbol of hope, a source of light for the people who migrated out of the niger Benue confluence. Ile Ife had survived and was now ready to redefine the political and social landscape for the people who lived in the forest south of the Niger River. Hello, welcome to the end of the video. If you liked what you just watched, please leave a like and subscribe to this channel. If you have any critique or questions, you can please leave a comment below. A big special thanks to my Patreon, I really appreciate you guys. And if you would love to join them to support more content like this in the future, you can do so on my Patreon page. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time, bye.